So what is the storyline of Ayurveda? It's very interesting. It begins with a conference on Ayurveda at the foothills of Himalayas. So what happened in this conference? A historic assembly of Ayurvedic Acharyas from not only India but also neighboring countries. You have names of countries like Persia and Greece. Uh, all, all, all of them assembled on the slopes of Himalayas and the aim something that we can relate to, to find a solution for the incre for increasing ill health. Sounds very, very familiar, isn't it? We still are uh, battling with the problem. Not only now, I mean, 5,000 years ago, they were battling with the same problem, increasing ill health. We are talking of a system which has been uh, you know, in existence for maybe 300, 350 years. So they have uh, 300 years of uh, observation and experience, research and development to understand how our system works and to uh, manage health and disease. Now, when we talk of Ayurveda, uh, something very unique pops up. This is a system which has been uh, in existence for uh, more than 5,000 years. It's a very conservative number, 5,000. It may be it's older than that as well. And what is important and interesting is that it has been in use continuously without a break. So we are talking of a system which has been in continuous use for 5,000 years. And you all can only imagine how much observations they would have made, how many diseases they would have encountered, how many patients they would have treated. But the question is, did they do it in a systematic way? Was there a framework which allowed them to, you know, contextualize their observations in a scientific and rational way? So this is the fundamental question. So let us uh, uh, look at the past, present, and future. If the past has allowed Ayurveda to develop in a scientific and rational manner, so before going into the past of Ayurveda, uh, so let us uh, connect some very important dots from Ayurveda's distant past. But before that, let us have a very quick a timeline of modern medicine because we are all very familiar with modern medicine. We have tremendous faith and trust in modern medicine and we know that it's something that has science and research and development and technology as the basis. So Hippocrates was the father of modern medicine. He lived between 460 and 377 BC, we all know. And he emphasized on logical rather than supernatural explanations for illness. And he relied on uh, logic and tangible evidence to explain and treat diseases. And, but the dissection of human cadavers were forbidden on religious grounds. And so they did not have uh, the anatomical details of uh, you know, the, the, the human system. He extrapolated human anatomy from that of pigs which at that point in time was considered most similar to humans. So the pig's anatomy served as the basis of Western medicine for the next 1,500 years. And it was in the 16th century that actually human anatomy was uh, you know, studied. In 1539, an Italian judge gave a judgment that uh, the bodies of executed criminals can be dissected for studying anatomy. And Vesalius, uh, he corrected the mistaken notion of human anatomy of Galen, used till about 1540 AD. This marked a very crucial step for Western medicine. There were also other developments which played a crucial role for the Western medicine to make the transition for, uh, to being scientific. So for example, the uh, discovery of circulation of blood by William Harvey in the 16th century, and discovery of microscope by Robert Hooke, and the, the, the huge compendium that uh, was written by uh, Morgagni 
on pathological anatomy. These were some landmark discoveries and, uh, you know, uh, which actually uh, helped uh, modern medicine to transit to being a scientific medicine. So technology and experiments brought in scientificity to Western medicine. Now let us see how Ayurveda evolved over time. So was there any scientific basis to it? Did it have a, um, a framework with which we can relate now? So the terrestrial, so we need to look at the history. The terrestrial evolution of uh, Ayurveda begins with sage Bharadvaja. And Bharadvaja was a great logician. He was a famous teacher of Tarka logic. It's mentioned in Udyotakara's uh, Nyaya Vartika. In fact, Charaka Samhita also mentions his name. And he laid the foundations for Ayurveda's logical concepts from which theories of Ayurveda evolved. He created eight medical specialities. This is very interesting because if you look at the way or the specialities have evolved in modern medicine, still you still have, you know, uh, you get uh, new specialities uh, getting, you know, being developed. Geriatrics only a few decades old and uh, um, uh, uh, pediatrics, small children were considered uh, Children were considered small adults. So pediatrics as a specialty was only maybe about 80, 90 years old. So initially they had only two specialties. One is surgery, the other is internal medicine. But if you look at Ayurveda, right from the day go, day one, it has, there were eight medical specialties. So things were thought over. There was a planning right in the beginning. And uh, Bharadwaja also wrote a number of books and he had many students. So what is the storyline of Ayurveda? It's very interesting. It begins with a conference on Ayurveda at the foothills of Himalayas. Of course, it is lost in the mists of uh, antiquity. And in fact, uh, Charaka Samhita, which is one of the books which has uh, survived, is actually proceedings, it's monograph of proceedings of, the, of this conference. So what happened in this conference? A historic assembly of Ayurvedic Acharyas from not only India, but also neighboring countries. You have names of countries like Persia and Greece. Uh, all, all, all of them assembled on the slopes of Himalayas. And you can see the references uh, at, the, at the end of the slide, at the bottom of the slide. And the aim? something that we can relate to, to find a solution for the incre for increasing ill health. Sounds very, very familiar, isn't it? We still are uh, battling with the problem. Not only now, I mean, 5,000 years ago, they were battling with the same problem, increasing ill health. And they deliberated on the advent of diseases, impeding a uh, long life and happiness of all creatures. So they did not discuss only about the health of human beings. They discussed about all creatures plants, animals, sarva bhuteshu, that's what, that is the word that's uh, constantly uh, used uh, in the Ayurvedic text. Bharadvaja explained the science of life and the three principles, etiology, symptomatology, and therapeutics as a means to well-being. In modern medicine, these three are still the, the major principles governing underlining a, a medical science. Etiology, the causative factors, uh, the symptoms and signs of the disease, and the treatment. The others deliberated, so just because Bharadvaja was a great Acharya, they did not agree to uh, whatever he said. They deliberated it, they debated on it, and then accepted these as the basic components of health or a medical system. Atreya was one of Bharadvaja's very famous student and he chaired the conference that took place at the foothills of Himalayas and he ushered in, he was principal, uh, he, was, he was the main person in ushering in rational and scientific medicine. He built over what his Acharya had uh, brought in. So he was, Atreya was a great rationalist teacher and a Vaidya. He emphasized the importance of uh, uh, scientific and logical thinking in medicine. 
He emphasized the importance of scientific discussions, how important it is to have scientific discussions, the importance of having debates, conferences, etc. And he laid down elaborate rules and regulations for conducting meetings, how to choose topics. So if the audience is, uh, if they are uh, familiar with the topic, with uh, it's the same domain, uh, expert, and then how do you choose a topic? If the uh, audience are not familiar with your area of uh, expertise, then how do you choose a topic? And how to write and review scientific works? Teaching methods, he talks about teaching methods, he talks about uh, uh, writing books for experts and lay people. How to arrange and classify medical concepts for books? Spotlighting salient points of a subject. How reason and logic are compromised in a hostile debate? And how to identify a true physician from a quack? All these are, uh, you know, elaborated and emphasized by Atreya. And Atreya had many students, and of these students, six were very famous. And he asked his six students to compile all the information systematically, whatever was happening in the conference, whatever was being deliberated in the conference, to be systematically uh, you know, documented and written as a complete treatise. Now, all the six compilations were placed before Atreya and the committed, uh, committee of select judges. The committee found all the treatises were well written, but and they accepted them, but that written by Agnivesha was considered the best and the most authoritative and declared so. Now, Atreya was instrumental in um, ushering in rational and scientific medicine and his student, uh, Agnivesha, he, was, he did the first time codification and systematic compilation of all information. So, he made a detailed record of the exposition of not only his teacher Atreya, but also the proceedings of the conference. And he codified the knowledge and arranged them in the form of a treatise. It was called Agnivesha Tantra. Agnivesha Tantra is what is now, what we know now as Charaka Samhita. So it was actually written by Agnivesha and it was redacted later and by Charaka and so it is called Charaka Samhita. So Agnivesha Tantra is probably the first written record of systematized medical knowledge in the world. So, from teachers to worthy students, Ayurveda has been passed on. Bharadvaja to Atreya to Agnivesha to Charaka and Dridabala. So, between Atreya and Dridabala, who hails from, who is uh, 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 considered to hail from Kashmir, uh, at least 1000 years had passed. Now, if we talk of the surgical discipline, so Atreya's focus was on uh, Kaya Chikitsa, which is the internal medicine. And surgery was again a very major branch uh, in Ayurveda. And surgical discipline begins with Dhanvantri, king of Kashi. It's not Lord Dhanvantri, it is king of Kashi. He was the first teacher of surgery on earth. And he was, Dhanvantri was the student, another student of uh, uh, Bharadwaja. And uh, Sushruta was Dhanvantri's student. Sushruta, I am sure all of you would have heard the name. He was a great surgeon. He is also the author of Sushruta Samhita. So, in Sushruta Samhita, a uh, method of dissection of human cadavers, it's uh, explained its importance, how to prepare a cadaver for dissection, and what instruments have to be used for dissection, how to develop expertise of surgery, how it's important to practice uh, uh, you know, surgery on cadavers and vegetables, importance of anatomy for practicing medicine, sterilization of surgical instruments, and various types of bandages and surgical instrument and sutures are all described in Sushruta Samhita. So there's a long list of Ayurvedic Acharyas. Uh, I have listed, uh, uh, you know, less than 1% of the Ayurvedic Acharyas that uh, uh, Ayurveda has had from Agastya to Tirumula to Kashyapa, Nimi, Jivaka. He was the personal physician of Buddha. Nagarjuna, Vagbhatta, Bhava Mishra, Madhavakara, and uh, Sharangadhara. So with the long list of outstanding Ayurvedic Acharyas, the list of milestones in Ayurveda also continues. Evolution of modern medicine. Technology and experiments had played a major role in its development. Whereas uh, uh, in Ayurveda, 
the scientific thim- thinking has played a major role. Lot of thought had gone into it. Lot of logic. Logic was the fundamental basis of, of uh, this system of medicine, and it has played a ma- scientific thinking has played a major role in the development of Ayurveda. And Ayurveda is a melting pot of uh, many disciplines, from Vriksha Ayurveda, which is uh, botany, uh, Mriga Ayurveda, veterinary uh, veterinary Ayurveda. Uh, yoga, meditation, mantra, uh, uh, astronomy, philosophy, because Ayurveda conceptualized the human system or it understood the human system as having uh, in all its, uh, uh, you know, in, in entirety, uh, taking into account all the domains of existence from physical, physiological, psychological, emotional and also spiritual. So philosophy was, uh, uh, you know, was also uh, contributed to the development of Ayurveda. So material science and met- metallurgy for making uh, the surgical instruments. Um, then you have uh, architecture, civil engineering and architecture because uh, uh, you know hospitals were built at that time. Agriculture, ethics, mathematics, chemistry, physics. So it's, it's a melting pot, uh, pot of many, many disciplines. So we have, I have uh, tried to give you all a bird's eye view, a glimpse of uh, you know, how Ayurveda had evolved in the past. And let us see whether the way it has evolved has any relevance to the healthcare at present. And then, of course, you know, uh, past uh, decides the present, and present, uh, you know, uh, has an influence on the future. So, present is the time of uh, increasing ill health. It is a great irony because uh, we live in the uh, era of science and technology and research and development. We have so much nuanced information about a biological system. We have wonderful techniques uh, to look at the most subtlest part of uh, the humans, right? So we have techniques which can uh, look at uh, the genes and you know the receptors and whatnot. It's unimaginable the the kind of equipments that are available now to study the uh, uh, biology at its subtlest level, but. The irony is that the diseases have not decreased. It has only increased. We are running out of names. And you know, we have a World Diabetes Day, World Obesity Day, World Cancer Day. In cancer, we have World Prostate Cancer Day, World, world. I mean, it's a shame. I think it's, it's, it's a shame. It's something that, uh, uh, that, uh, that one needs to introspect as to what has gone wrong. That with this kind of information that we have about the functioning of a human system and the sophisticated technologies we have. Why is it that we are where we are? Anyway, that's a question for another, uh, you know, uh, 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 presentation. But present is also the time of uh, a paradigm shift in thinking in modern medicine and biology. It's the time for uh, systems biology and systems approach in modern medicine. Modern medicine has always been reductionistic in its viewpoint. But now, you know, there is a big paradigm shift that they are talking about holistic medicine, holistic health, systems approach, and so on. So what is the, um, so this is the model of uh, human system, and we are all very familiar with it. Uh, Anything physical in the world, including uh, uh, our uh, human system, body, is made up of atoms. So atom is the fundamental building block of everything physical in the world, including the human uh, body. So atoms make molecules, molecules make organelles, you have cells, then you have tissues, organ, organ system, and the entire organism. And this is called structural reductionism because the entire organism is reduced to the level of its fundamental entities, building blocks. In fact, modern medicine is also called molecular medicine because it tries to, it understands uh, the system uh, at the level of molecules and it also understands disease at the level of molecules, and it tries to address the problem at the level of molecule. Now, this is a, I'm sorry that uh, the contrast is pretty poor here. So, um, when you move up the structural hierarchy, there are emerging complexities. So, there are new properties which emerge at the next level, which you don't find at the lower level. So, for example, if you look at atom, right? It does not have chemical bonds. Chemical bonds is a property that evolves at the level of molecules. And if you move still further up, 
you have new functions, you have replications, you have specialized functions and so on. So there are emerging properties at each level. So you may ask, you know, so what is, what is uh, so uh, different about it? There is something very, very interesting that happens. So there are emerging complexities at each level and uh, let us make a small step from atom to molecule, right? Let us uh, 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 talk about water molecule. Water molecule is made up of uh, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. So let us take a very simple property, boiling point of water, right? So we know that the boiling point of water is 100 degrees centigrade. Does anybody know uh, what the boiling point of hydrogen or oxygen is? Boiling point of hydrogen is minus 252.8 degrees centigrade and that of oxygen is minus 183 degrees centigrade. They do not add up to 100 degrees centigrade, right? Right? So the property of water is not property of hydrogen plus the property of oxygen, right? And we can look at many properties like this and we will find that the property of ox the water is never, you know, linear addition of the property of its individual components. So from atom to molecule, it's such a small step and you see the kind of complexity that has emerged. Now we are talking of, you know, uh, when we talk of health, of course, we don't talk of health of a molecule. We talk of health of a person, right? So the person is at the end of the complexity. So between molecule and the entire uh, human system, you can only imagine the multifold complexities that would have emerged. Molecule does not have a mind. It does not have a consciousness. But the end product has mind, consciousness, and whatnot. So the question is whether the management of health and disease, should it be done at the beginning of complexity or the end of complexity, right? Now let us uh, leave this question uh, aside for the moment and let us see how Ayurveda has conceptualized the human system. So Ayurveda talks of different domains in the human system. So it first talks of a structural domain. And this structural domain is networked through what are called srotas. Srotas means channels. So the entire physical structure of the human system is networked through channels. Channels will be lymphatic vessels, veins, uh, you know, blood vessels, and so on. And then it talks of a physiological domain. It is networked through a set of parameters defined by Vata, Pitta and Kapha. I am sure all of you would have heard of this uh, 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 terminologies Vata, Pitta and Kapha. And then you have a psychological domain which is networked through a set of psychological parameters defined by uh, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And then you have the, the subtlest part of human existence which is the domain of consciousness and this is connected network through levels of awareness which are dealt with in great detail uh, in yoga. These are called panchakoshas. Right? So you see how the four domains are intra-networked, intra-connected. Not only that, you can see the areas of overlap. Right? So for example, the structural and the physiological domain is connected via through these um, uh, uh, parameters defined by Vata, Pitta and Kapha. Then the psychological and the uh, physiological domain is again connected through Vata, Pitta and Kapha. The psychological and the domain of consciousness is connected through Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. And these are subdivided into 16 subtypes. And then the subtlest domain, I think the beauty is here. I do not know whether you all have picked up this. The subtlest domain of human existence, which is the consciousness, is connected to the gross structural domain through the first level of awareness. The first level of awareness is our body. So if I am alive, I have to be aware of my body. So that is the first level of awareness. And that deals with the structural domain. So the subtlest domain of human existence connects directly with the uh, structural domain. And you see how the entire human system is understood as a seamless whole. Intraconnected, 
within each domain and then interconnected as well. So you have a seamless, uh, uh, you know, interconnected whole. Uh, that's how the human system is conceptualized. So we are seamlessly uh, mind, body and soul in Ayurveda. And so these are two different ways of understanding the same human system. The one on the left is the understanding by, uh, by Ayurveda, where it looks at it as an interconnected whole. On the right hand side, you see uh, how the system is understood in terms of its structures using a reductionistic approach. So it's the same human system, but there are two different ways of understanding how you look at it are different. And that standpoint will define the terminologies used, the approaches that are going to be used. So let us go back to this question. Where do you, how do you, which level do you manage the health and the disease of humans? Is it at the beginning of complexity or at the end of complexity? You don't have to be a scientist or a doctor to say that you have to handle it at the level of, at the end of complexity, right? So the current management in modern medicine is predominantly at the beginning of complexity. That is why they are running into so much problem. Because when you have a complex system, there are two things that you can do. One is get information about the components. And the second is manage the system. They are two different things. You cannot manage a complex system, you cannot micromanage it at the level of the fundamental, the, uh, the, the constituents. You will have to manage it at a slightly different level, which is what Ayurveda uh, has, uh, has done. So you have uh, Ayurveda, uh, which understands the human system as a seamless interconnected whole. And then this is in st uh, stark contrast to the, uh, the, the structural hierarchical understanding of the human system by modern medicine. So this uh, picture captures the difference between, fundamental difference between these two systems. So on the right here, uh, left, you see uh, the bird's eye view of a landscape, forest. So from the height from which it is viewed, the entire landscape is captured in its entirety. From that height, you do not get the nitty gritty details of the constituents. So from this height, you know how if something changes in the system, in that landscape, you can capture it. You see the picture on the right side. It is the microstructure of one of the leaf in one of the tree in the forest. So from that level, you get information in all its glory, but you can't see the entire picture. From this height, you see the picture, entire picture in its entire glory, but you don't get information on the uh, individual component. So these are two different complementary ways of looking at the same system. So the present is, I said, you know, it's the time of systems biology and systems approach in medicine. And you see how Ayurveda, by, by the sheer way difference in which it has conceptualized the human system, it is way ahead, ahead of the curve. It is way ahead of modern medicine uh, in the way it handles the system as a whole. Now, I would like to take you all through uh, a, a bit more, uh, you know, uh, 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 some more information on how Ayurveda uh, actually prag at the pragmatic level, how it handles health and uh, disease. So conceptualization is one thing. Has it been able to translate it into a workable model? I think that is a more uh, fundamental uh, important question. So Ayurveda has classified the human system into two uh, groups, subtle, sukshma, and uh, sthula sharira. And it has further uh, subclassifications. It has classified it based on structure, where the entire focus is the physical aspect of the body. Then there is a functional classification. And here, you know, uh, the focus is on physiological and psychological aspect. Of course, when you say physiological, you know, implied is that there has to be a physical basis. Without a physical basis, there is no physiological functions. And uh, then you have the system-wise classification, which uh, deals with physical, physiological, and psychological aspects of human existence. And then you have the subtle aspect 
the sukshma sharira where the levels of awareness are dealt with and de this deals with the psychological and realms of uh, uh, other realms of awareness so let me uh, quickly take you all through this uh, functional classification because this runs as an undercurrent to the entire ayurvedic uh, understanding of uh, health and disease and also how it manages health and disease so ayurveda has identified three functions it considers uh, important movement transformation and metabolism and transformation and growth so in the specific context of ayurveda these are called vata pitta and kapha i will refer to these as vp and k for convenience vp and k are characterized by uh, a set of parameters which are biophysical chemical physiological and psychological in nature and it encompasses the entire psychophysiological functions so there are no psychophysiological functions which comes outside the purview of this classification of vata pitta and kapha so these are some uh, uh, some examples of uh, some of the parameters so you see that the parameters are all biophysical parameters you know like dryness fluidity adhesivity i would like to mention that although the information is given in english all this information is taken from classical ayurvedic texts so none is uh, you know coming out of my own imagination or interpretation so physic uh, in the biophysical parameters you see dryness fluidity adhesivity size stiffness viscosity and so on and then you have ph of course ayurveda does not use the word ph it talks about acidity so the inference is that it's it indicates ph temperature and then you see the psychological parameters creativity anxiety confidence leadership quality patience fear endurance uh, insecurity and so on all these parameters comes outside uh, comes uh, or classified under vata pitta and kapha and uh, it actually uh, uh, these parameters are associated connected with each other so i have represented them as a network and you can see that the parameters from b1 to uh, uh, b7 uh, denotes parameters under uh, vata would you like me to wind down 5 minutes yes okay uh, okay so you see that it is as a uh, you know it's a it's a network which uh, has parameters defined by vata pitta and kapha connected with each other and when this network is in balance it uh, denotes uh, uh, health and when it is uh, perturbed it denotes disease and uh, something very ingenious that uh, our ancestors have done is that they have made vpk as a common platform because the human system is understood in terms of uh, vata pitta and kapha everything all factors which impact health and disease comes under vata pitta and kapha be it uh, uh, food ingredients or medicinal plants or even symptoms lifestyle activities everything can be understood in terms of vata pitta and kapha so the treatment is management is very very comprehensive so there are uh, physical interventions then there are non pharmacological interventions as well so we have seen the past we have seen that the present has uh, relevance and if the present has a relevance then you know uh, future will have to have some uh, give us some hope as well right so another two three slides i am done uh, so uh, now you know modern medicine is talking of holistic health it talks about uh, importance of diet and lifestyle and mental health and so societal health and biological health and so on so let me skip this slide um so if you look at the understanding of health in ayurveda it is multi dimensional so it uh, considers so many uh, parameters and aspects uh, for a person to have uh, holistic health and the health is multi parametric in ayurveda and uh, it's a multimodal delivery as well there are various ingenious ways of delivering health uh, to uh, to an individual empowering an individual to take care of his or her own health and there are uh, traditional cuisines there are uh, you know uh, customs are inbuilt into our festivals and traditions and you know it's a multimodal delivery and so the futuristic these are the futuristic concepts in modern medicine personalized treatment and health preventive medicine promotive health systems approach circadian rhythm and health mind and health precision nutrition therapeutic nutrition sustainable medicine and so on all these are concepts being discussed uh, in modern medicine and these are working concepts in ayurveda 
So uh, I will end with uh, the dictum of not only Ayurveda, but uh, the, the Indian culture may all be happy. Health is not to be made into a business. Ayurveda is very, very uh, categorical about it. May all be uh, um, happy, may all be healthy, may all enjoy prosperity and may none suffer. And thank you very much. Thank you.